Okay, I think uh, we're ready to begin. So my name is Robin Jones I'm from RSK Biosensus. Um, welcome to our first Thursday club. Um, before we begin, I'll just uh, run through some housekeeping notes. Um, if you could pop them on the screen, Elizabeth. Yeah. Um, yeah. First of all, um, all, all attendees uh, have their microphones muted for obvious reasons throughout the, the webinar, but that's not because we don't want to hear from you. Um, we really do encourage questions. Um, and so if during the presentation you have a question, please pop it in, um, please post it on, online in, in the box provided. Um, I'll receive those questions and then we'll have a question and answer session after the presentation. Um, if for any reason we run out of time or we don't get to your questions, we'll really try to come back to you after the session. Um, the third point is after the webinar today, we'll receive a link to a short survey. Um, if you could take a few minutes to provide uh, some comments, feedback, that'd be, that'd be really great so we can help to improve our webinars in future. So um, this month's presentation is given by Elizabeth Clements. Uh, she's going to be discussing the freshwater pearl mussel. It's both a protected and a priority species for, for biodiversity and has a fascinating life history. So I'm, I'm really looking forward to it myself. Um, Elizabeth will be describing the biology, some of the threats they face um, and current and possible future actions for conservation. Elizabeth is a principal consultant here at RSK Wilding. She has a particular interest in freshwater habitats, river restoration and land management. Her experience includes working for bodies such as the EA and Scottish Natural Heritage and as head of natural environment at North York um, Moors National Park Authority. Um, she's completed research on freshwater pearl mussel at the Scottish Centre for Ecology, Natural Environment and admits that she's never happier than when she's rootling around in a river. Uh, so there's no one more qualified to talk to us about pearl mussels today. So no further ado, I'll, um, I'll hand over to Elizabeth. Um, and uh, yeah, enjoy. Thank you, Robin. What a great introduction. Um, I hope I live up to that. Uh, it's lovely to have you all uh, join me for this webinar today and um, for me to get the opportunity to talk about freshwater pearl mussels. Um, I'm going to talk, a little, as Robin said, a little bit about freshwater pearl mussels and the life history strategies and the threats that they are now facing um, in this country and further afield. A little bit about the research that I carried out on freshwater pearl mussels, um, current work that's ongoing to save these animals and future actions that conservation can be involved with. So the freshwater pearl mussel, it's widely regarded as an indicator flagship umbrella and keystone species and that was a quote from Geist who is a a German researcher and he said that in 2010 and I hope by the end of this presentation you can see why. The freshwater pearl mussel is a large bivalve mollusk approximately 17 centimetres in length and it's one of the longest lived species in the in invertebrate species in the world. They commonly live over 100 years old but um, they have been found to be 210 years old up in the sort of the Scandinavian regions. Um, they have an extended juvenile period of about 12 years old and they don't start becoming an active part of the reproduc uh, reproducing, reproducing population until they're about 6.5 centimetres uh, in length. Um, unlike marine mussels, as adults they don't have the byssus threads that attaches them to rocks or um, other substrates but as you can see in the picture uh, that's an adult mussel in my hands and that sort of jelly thing that is coming out with pebbles attached to it is the foot that they use to bury into the substrate and anchor themselves into the riverbed. When you've got um, uh, perfect conditions for freshwater pearl mussels you can have uh, up to 400 adult individuals per square metre. So the distribution of freshwater pearl mussels they were once thought to be abundant, one of the most abundant freshwater biovalves in the ancient rivers of the northern hemisphere, but exploitation, management and conservation has been documented since pre-Roman times and trade between the Roman Empire included wheat, hunting dogs and freshwater pearl mussels. And it's thought that one of the reasons Julius Caesar inv invaded the UK was to take control of the freshwater pearl trade. So trading pearls from Scotland and around Europe has been documented from as early as the 12th century 
And by the 16th century, there's a significant trade across particularly Britain and Ireland. And so a little bit about the habitat of freshwater pearl mussels. That's me, sat somewhere beautiful in Scotland. Um, they like fast flowing, highly oxygenated rivers, low calcium content. Um, they're typically found at the head of rivers, riffles in stable substrates um, and with clean gravels stabilised by large boulders and cobbles. This is another of my survey sites on a, on a beautiful day, but it's a bit of an illusion because some of the sites were very, very midgy and not places you wanted to spend very much time. So what I find most fascinating about the freshwater pearl mussel is its life history strategy. Some of the causes of decline of freshwater pearl mussel in rivers are common to many of our freshwater species. However, their life history strategy is perhaps not quite as complicated as the freshwater pearl mussel. Um, their life history strategy includes an obligate parasite stage on either a, uh, on a salmonid host, which is either Atlantic salmon, trout or Arctic char in this country. So if you look at the diagram, that first picture at the top, that's an adult mussel. And in between May and June, it's temperature dependent, the males release spermatozoa into the water, which are then inhaled by female adults into, into the shells and um, the eggs are fertilized and the females brood the eggs for about six weeks. Then again, temperature dependent, in July and late summer, the females use broadcast spawning to release about 4 million glycidia or larvae each into the water course, which is then inhaled by juvenile salmonids, and that, that's fish that are less than a year old. Those glycidia or larvae have no means of propulsion, so the glycidia move through the water column and they only happen upon the fish. The glycidia snap shut onto the gill filaments of the fish. Um, it's thought to be um, the change in the salt content on the gill filaments, which is what makes this happen. And you can see if you go in a clockwise direction, the third photograph, the little tiny white dots, that's individual glycidia on each gill filament. And when they attach to the gill filaments, the glycidia become insisted by tissue produced by the fish and what's thought to be an immune response to something attaching to them. Um, this broadcast type um, reproduction strategy is not particularly uh, uh, efficient, it's wasteful and 99.9% .9 of the glycidia produced by a, a female adult mussel um, won't even find a host fish. Um, but in May to July of the of the year that the following the year that the glycidia attached to the fish, tiny, tiny juvenile mussels drop off the gills of the fish and bury, completely bury into the substrate where they live in the interstitial spaces for about five years. So each um there's about 10 thousand glycid uh, on sorry i'll start that again <laughs> in laboratory conditions um there's but found to be about ten thousand glycidia on each naught plus fish and um, we don't find that many in the wild because they are shed um through the immune response of the fish so it's really quite impressive that we have any freshwater pearl mussels at all because once those fish those glycidia have been attached to the fish anything can happen to the fish they get eaten um, they, they get washed out of a river, um, they die through natural causes. Um, so when they've fallen off, they also need to find appropriate gravels. And by the end of this process, only 0.0.1, 0 .0 um, 0 0.001 of the original glycidia that were released in the water column actually survive and live to 12 years to become part of the reproducing pop adult population. So pearl fishing in the, in the UK. We might not have heard about it, we might not think it's a big deal, but it really is. It's thought that freshwater pearls were fished for before marine mussels and their beauty um, as uh, in jewellery and as high value items in the crown jewels was really very valued. Um, but only one in 10,000 mussels actually produces a pearl, so it's really labour intensive. Um, the trade in pearls, as I said before, was once thought to be a driving force for why Julius Caesar invented the UK. Now, this picture of the crown jewels on the slide right now is the Kelly Pearl, and it's believed to be the one of the largest, it, it, it includes the Kelly Pearl, which is believed to be one of the largest mussels ever discovered in Scotland, and it was on the tributary of the River Iton in Aberdeenshire. 
Um, it's now included in what's called the Honours of Scotland and dates back to the 15th century. Um, and any other historical pictures that you see of the royal family, particularly of Queen Elizabeth I, also includes many Scottish pearls. At this time in the 15th century, um, the government employed river bailiffs to ensure that any mussels that were found were directly um, sent to the king's treasury. Now, must remember that when we're talking about mussel, pearl mussel fishing, um, historically, what happened was uh, a traveling person usually would go to a river, they would look for the mussel beds and they uh, using a viewing bucket um, and they would use this sort of equipment. So that's a um, just a split cane and they would um, remove a mussel from the riverbed and they use the tongues to open up the shell without breaking the abductor mussels that hold the two parts of the shell together they would look inside the mussel and see if there was a pearl. They could remove the pearl, but then they would, most importantly, put the adult mussel back into the riverbed so it could remain as part of the reproducing population. Unfortunately, it's a little more um, aggressive these days and um, people will still go take mussels, break open the shell, killing the mussel and discard the shell when they find that there's no mussel in there. So the decline in Margaritifera has been widely documented and by the 19th century the level of exploitation in Britain and Ireland was unsustainable and the fishery declined to a small scale but constant trade by travelling people well into the 1980s. Scotland did once have 61 breeding mussel rivers and was home to more than half of the world's population of freshwater pearl mussels. However, since the 1970s, Scotland has been losing mussels at a rate of two rivers a year. In the 1980s, it was reported that only three of the 12 rivers in southern Europe still contained Margaritifera, And by the 90s, only one river in England and one river in Wales were thought to hold viable recruiting populations. In the year 2000, it was reported that 65% of Scotland's rivers known to have Margaritifera no longer had functional populations, but Scotland does remain a stronghold for the species. In the 1950s, Finland made it illegal to take animals from the wild, but it wasn't until 1991 that Margaritifera were added to Schedule 5 of the Wildlife and Countryside Act in the UK. And at this time, it was still possible to take mussels to inspect them for pearls and return them to the wild. In 2011, with many populations in Europe showing no functional recruitment in over 30 years, and the species being threatened or highly vulnerable in every part of its range, the IUCN defined the species as critically endangered in Europe and globally threatened. In 2020-11, sadly, Margaritifera joined the list of 365 most endangered species in the world. So what are the current threats to freshwater pearl mussels? There would be exploitation that we've talked about, pearl mussel fishing, um, host fish species. So um, it's a long lived species and the success or otherwise of its obligatory parasite phase of the glochidio on the gills of salmonids may have been affected in changes in salmonid populations in this country. In turn, this may have been artificially exacerbated by management actions primarily to improve fish stocks um, so stocking of trout and salmon in our rivers and also by accidentally uh, um, accidental escapees from fish farms, particularly in the northwest of Scotland. And also habitat conditions. It's um, we all know about it, but the, the conditions of rivers in this country is um, not good. Um, and these are very sens sensitive, long lived species that are impacted by the changes in the aquatic environment. So just to focus a bit more on mussels and their hosts, I'm just going to tell you a little bit about um, the research that I conducted when I was at the Scottish Centre for Ecology and Environmental um, Science. So I was particularly looking at the mussels and their host um, fish species. So the host fish species for freshwater pearl mussels is salmonids. That could be Atlantic salmon, brown trout or Arctic trout in the UK. Um, and our understanding at the time was based on laboratory studies of one east coast river in Scotland and field studies on one west coast river and those studies were carried out in Scotland in the 80s. The conclusion of those was that salmon 
where present, were always the preferential host, even if trout were in the river. And this was backed up by um, Haste, um, Lee Hasty and Mark Young in 2001, who looked at six rivers on the east coast and the west coast. However, these studies looked at the number of glycidia attached to gill filaments in the autumn after they were first attached. Now, we know that a lot of those um, glycidia are lost before they reach maturity and can drop off as tiny mussels um, in the late summer. In 2010 in Central Europe, there were some studies that looked at um, salmon and, uh, sorry, trout, and they found that trout were the primary host of Margotifera. They looked at suitability of different salmonid strains as hosts, not just salmon or trout. And the most suitable hosts were trout from within their natural distribution of the freshwater pearl mussels. So some of the laboratory studies that were carried out before, they had mussels in a lab and they got trout or salmon from a local hatchery. It might not have been from the same river that the mussels came from. Whereas in Central Europe, they looked to see um, whether the fish that came from the same river as the mussels um, insisted differently to ones that came from a hatchery situation. So I went about my study to look at um, how this um, particular relationship followed through in Scotland, and these are the results. So I looked at eight rivers and surveyed across Scotland, and they were chosen based on historical information that the rivers had both brown trout and Atlantic salmon in the same river, and there was at least some historical pres um, evidence of presence of freshwater pearl mussels. So um, what we can see from this table, if I draw your attention to River B, this was a river that was found to be dominated by salmon, but only trout were infected by glucidia. River F, again, was dominated by salmon, but only trout were infected. And again, River H, 45 salmon were caught and 32 trout were caught, but again, only trout were infected. Um, and the, the, the blue, the blue um, rivers there, they were just really small sample sizes, so it was difficult, difficult to get any um, significant results either way. So the results from that study um, don't correspond with the understanding that salmon are the primary host in Scotland, uh, but they do align with the results from Central Europe that trout are the primary host um, and the studies that show that we should be looking at what the salmonid is in the natural distribution of the freshwater pearl population that we're studying. Um, as I said before, freshwater pearl mussels being a long-lived species, the success or otherwise of this obligatory parasite phase of the glycidia on the gills of salmon may be one of the primary reasons um, for its success or decline. Um, and uh, yeah, looking at, the, there is a lot less stocking of trout and salmon in rivers in Scotland, but some of the West Coast rivers, um, the escapee, accidental escapees from fish farms has led to long-term genetic changes in natural populations of fish. So do we have a problem with our freshwater pearl mussels reproducing because the, the host fish are just the wrong genetic type. So in the future, it would be really useful to be able to focus studies on the genetics of the fish and the watercourse that they've come from and see whether there are any native stocks, whether it's a native stock problem. Okay. Um, so yeah, so the next thing that I looked at in my study was flow conditions. And it's widely accepted that anthropogenic changes in river flows at an ecologically rele uh, relevant level are a key component of freshwater habitat and species decline. Many rivers have regulated flow regimes and such reg regulation generally leads to a reduction in overall ecological status. But um, in a report by Thomas and Hurry in 2012, they found that some species requirements that are sensitive to hydrological regime changes may be enhanced by certain flow operations. So for instance, um, this picture here is um, uh, old mill laid on a river in Scotland again, and it's thought that because um, the flow was very consistent all year round and it wasn't um, subjected to high peak flows um, and droughts that the mussels thrived there. This is also the case in the River Kerry in the northwest of Scotland. It's a heavily modified flow regime with a reservoir at the top of it, and there remains to be a large and functioning population of Margotifera, and it's thought that this 
is because the reduced um, the magnitude of the peak flows and the frequency of flood events is greatly reduced and it provides a steady minimum flow throughout the year. This river is effectively in a morphologically stable condition. Um, many rivers have in Scotland have been affected by damming. There's a lot of hydro schemes um, and uh, reservoirs and they cover about 20% of the area of mainland Scotland. So this could be having a really significant effect on not just freshwater pearl mussels, but a lot of our um, freshwater species. So what did I do? I collected 150 mussels um, to, to look at how, I wanted to look at the information on how changes in flow conditions can affect mussels. And at that point in time, the data was very deficient. Um, so being able to make decisions on how we should manage our rivers that are heavily regulated um, was important. So for the flume part of my study, I investigated the behavioural responses of adult Margotifera to three contrasting flow regimes, two substrate complexities and two groupings of animals. I collected 150 adult mussels in November under licence from Scottish Natural Heritage of Nature Scott at the moment, uh, as it now is from a disused mill laid in Scotland and maintains them in a shallow trough approximately 25 centimetres deep filled with water directly from Loch Lomond. Each individual animal was measured and photographed as you can see in that photograph there that would be number 25 and they were kept in the maintenance trough at the Scottish Centre for Ecology and Natural Environment. Um, for each experiment six mussels were chosen at random um, and uh, were kept in the flume for a period of acclimation overnight 15 hours during which the velocity remained constant in the flume and following that the experiments included three different flow regimes so we had a flow regime that was kept constant one that increased in velocity rapidly and one that increased um, in velocity gradually over a, a, an extended period of time we had two distributions which you can see in these photographs whether i placed them in the flume um, clumped together or whether they were um, further apart and then two st substrate complexities so a simple um, uh, substrate where it was just the gravels and then a more complex one where there were boulders that broke up the flow main linear flow of the river, uh, of the flume so the statistical analysis looked at the speed of the burial of each muscle the depth of the burial of the muscle so the vertical movement how far they went from the surface of the gravel and horizontal movement, so how far across the riverbed effectively they would be moving in, in um, response to the changes in flow velocity. And also the washout of the mussels, so how high a velocity did the water get to um, before a mussel was entrained in the flow. So just quickly, um, uh, the results of the flow conditions were that the analysis showed that the rate of change, so how quickly the flow increased, and the velocity impacted most on responses of the freshwater pearl mussels. In gradually and rapidly increasing velocity, the mussels were found to bury faster and deeper compared with velocities that remained constant throughout the experiment. The depth of burial of individuals in rapidly and gradually increasing velocities, velocities was significantly deeper than in velocities that remained constant. So we made the we were making the water flow faster, the mussels actually buried quicker and deeper. Um, so the mean velocity at siphon level increased, as did the depth of the burial. Um, the study group at scene was led by Dr. Rianne Thomas and Professor Colin Adams, and they've continued these studies in the field and in the flume. And in 2021, they updated this research and published a paper in the Journal of Aquatic Conservation and Adaptive Responses of Mussels to Manage Drawdowns, and that was Dr. Ed Curley that, edited, um, that published that. And their study showed that Margotivera can detect the alterations in flow depth, which culminate in the immersion of mussel beds, and, the respond, and they respond by undertaking vertical and horizontal movement to mitigate the risk of prolonged aerial exposure. So the results of the field trial corroborated results from the flume experiment, with 80% of mussels shown to avoid immersion successfully by tracking receding water levels. The finding of this study support the role of controlled drawdowns in regulated rivers to reduce mortalities associated with receding water levels during prolonged low flow episodes. So in reality, 
we're, what we're saying is that if we talk to someone like Scottish Water and they need to change their flow regime, they can do it over a longer period of time. It will have less of a detrimental impact on the mussels. But like glucidurin and cismin, differences in populations and responses highlight a need to adopt a context dependent approach to conservation efforts. So what can we do? These poor little mussels, they're, uh, they, they've got a complicated life history strategy. The rivers that they live in are regulated. Um, it, it, what actions can we do to help them um, maintain them into the future? So we've worked at looking at protecting and restoring and re uh, remaining population of freshwater pearl mussels. So protection includes raising the awareness of the plight of the freshwater pearl mussels, meaning it, it's very easy to see a Tasmanian devil or a giant anteater or some other charismatic megafauna, but are we actually thinking about freshwater pearl mussels in the UK? And we need um, river users to be aware of what they're seeing when they're out, particularly kayakers and anglers, um, report what they see, report if they see um, shells that have deliberately been broken and are piled up on the side of riverbeds. It might not just be an otter that's been having a feast, it could be someone with um, not such honest um, pursuits in mind. Um, and we need to keep the survey data um, up to date. It's very difficult to survey freshwater pearl mussels in some areas. They like to be in deep water pools as well as in fast flowing areas. And we also need to be aware of the check clean dry GB secretariat invasive non-native species um, plans. There is a launch every year to make people aware of what they're doing so they're not moving river to river and taking um, things like um, killer shrimps with them or, or introducing other invasive mussels from outside the UK. What else can we do? We can look at restoring the habitat. That includes the water quality and the water quantity, the hydrology and the geomorphology. Removing in-stream obstacles to salmonids also helps in freshwater pearl mussels. Um, putting buffer strips in and um, reducing diffuse pollution and restoring riparian habitats and maintaining them for the future. So simple actions like planting trees and reducing the um, uh, temperatures of rivers. How can, we all, how can we deliver this though? Partnership working is the way to go. Um, and this sort of work is only possible through partnership working, as we all know that funding for conservation projects is a challenge and a massive challenge for such a long lived species. A lot of conservation pots of money will give you five years of money but for a species that's in its juvenile phase for at least 12 years that doesn't give you um, very long to get any actions actually delivering. So since 2007 the Freshwater Biological Association based in Windermere have been leading the way in research into captive breeding and reintroduction methods led by their director of science Dr Louise Lavoctoire have been very successful. Um, I was also in, involved in a project called Pearls in Peril between 2012 and 2016. Um, and that, in, that was a UK-wide life, EU life-funded project bringing, bringing together 22 partners shown here on the screen and organisations to restore habitats that benefit freshwater pearl mussels and salmonids. A total of 48 actions were delivered across 21 rivers all the rivers were designated as special areas of conservation for freshwater pearl mussels in order to secure the long-term survival of the mussel populations. Um, the actions included everything from um, per the pearl goes to school, so teaching school children about it, having river rangers that would patrol some of the areas where we knew that exploitation would happen, and bigger river restoration projects, looking at removing obstacles and restoring connectivity of rivers to floodplains and things like that. So following on from this project, um, in 2015 to 2018, a project called Restoring Freshwater Pearl Mussels in England, which was funded by BIFA in partnership with the EA, Natural England and the North York Moors National Park Authority and Devon Wildlife Trust, Cumbria Wildlife Trust and the South Cumbria Rivers Trust, um, uh, continued some of the work that was started in the PIP project. Um, but that's also meant that the um, Freshwater Biological um, association again, again led by Louise um, could continue some of their work on the River Ert um, through the financial support of BIFA and United, in, in particular United Utilities and in March this year they were able to publish a paper discussing um, the captive breeding and success 
of the programme at the FBA. And they released 1,300 tagged mussels in 2021, 1,100 in 2023. And they hope that this will continue into the future. Another project that I've been involved in um, was in North Yorkshire. Again, this was kickstarted by BIFA, but the funding is now continuing through financial contribution and support of particularly Ben Aston at Yorkshire Water and the North York Moors National Park Authority to establish a captive breeding population from the River Esk in North Yorkshire at the FBA facility. Um, so adult mussels have been taken from the River Esk to the FBA and they now have a very small population of juvenile mussels. And in the meantime, there's huge efforts ongoing on the River Esk to ensure that those juvenile mussels have a river to return to in the future. Um, more information about all of these um, ARC projects can be found on the FBA website. So, as I said at the beginning, the freshwater pearl mussel is widely regarded as an indicator, flagship and umbrella and keystone species. I find them a fascinating, biologically, historically and culturally important species. Um, uh, there's still a lot to learn about them and partnership working to be, level, to be able to deliver actions on the ground is essential. This is a little picture of me. It's not all um, sunny pictures in Scotland, but if you don't believe the things that I've said or want to learn more, on a Friday evening, you could always watch this film, Scottish Muscle, which had um, uh, Tallulah Riley in and uh, Harry Enfield. Um, I have to say I've never worn a red bikini when I've been fishing for pearl mussels, but I'm sure there are some occasions when that might fit into the PP requirements, but not while I'm there. Um, Thank you all for listening and that's me finished. Brilliant, thanks very much Elizabeth, that was, that was great. Um, so um, we have got some, some questions, if you wanna pop your camera back on. Um, yeah, quite a, few, quite a few interesting questions, so I'll, I'll run through no. some of those now. Need some easy um, questions. <laughs> oh yeah, yeah, no, they're they're, they're all fine. Um, I'll I'll start with one uh, one easy one is if it, you mentioned finding uh, mussel shells um, on a riverbank, is is there any other mussel species we might get confused by? Are there other mussels out there that that we should think about? Yes, um, there are a plethora of other mussels. Um, what would distinguish the fresh the the um, the the freshwater pearl mussels um, would be the location that you're at and the quality of the river. So if you imagine a line being drawn from North Yorkshire down to Cornwall, everything sort of north of that um, uh, is, is where you would find them. You also find pea mussels and swan mussels and duck mussels were the most common ones. And they're more likely to be found in the silty margins of rivers um, than in the sort of the fresh gravel beds that we're looking for freshwater pearl mussels. Um, they're also smaller, paler in colour, and um, the hinge um, looks slightly different. So on a on a adult freshwater pearl mussel, the hinge of the mussel is much further down um, the shell than on pea mussels and swan mussels. Um, so there are other mussels out there, but um, I think uh, yeah. Take a photograph with a scale of what you can find and send it to somebody who knows more about mussels. Don't just assume that it's not one. Um, but yeah. Yeah. Great. Okay. Um, uh, another one is, is, is there any evidence that other mussels have pearls or is it just the freshwater pearl mussel? Just the freshwater pearl mussel in this country is, um, and there are other mussels um, that make pearls in North America and the Asian clams and things like that, that are very similar but in this country, it's just a freshwater pearl mussel. Great. Um, uh, one here about the fish species. Um, is there any evidence that pearl mussel use species other than char, salmon or trout? What about grayling, perhaps? Uh, no evidence of grayling that I know of. Um, not sure actually if there might be some evidence of grayling in North America where freshwater pearl mussels are, um, but not in this country and not in, not in Scotland and Wales and England. Okay, great. Um, uh, another fish related one here is, um, is there any evidence that harboring the glucidia 
makes the fish more susceptible to other parasites or disease? Um, not parasites or disease. There was a paper written not that long ago that said it might have a, a, a high infection from Crocidia, might have a, a small impact on their sort of um, ability to, um, I don't want to be negative about it, it doesn't impact them in, in their mortality rates. Um, you find um, the juvenile mussels in places with higher oxygenated water, which is um, a, a good place to be for a juvenile fish anyway. Um, so they sort of tend to congregate in those places more than go into the lower oxygenated parts when they've got less glucidia on their gills. Okay, cool. Um... Uh, what, are, what about what are the impacts of climate change affecting the levels of pearl mussels? Is it are there issues with temperature fluctuations or flooding, perhaps? That um, so, if you, if you remember a few years ago, there was a big flood in um, Aberdeenshire. It was Storm Frank, and um, the river was the the water levels that were going through the River Dee were the equivalent of Olympic swimming pool every so many seconds and it would be very difficult for some of those adult mussels to not become entrained in um, in that sort of a flow. However, if we've restored our rivers which makes them more resilient to those sort of high flow events so that there are backwaters and less turbulent parts of the river um, that the mussels can be in where the flows aren't so impacted by high flow events that would be beneficial. So. Um, in the face of climate change, it really means that we need to be restoring our rivers so that they can be resilient and cope with those fluctuations um, rather than trying to prevent them because we, we just can't, so we need to prepare them for it. Um, yeah, so restoring, reconnecting rivers to the floodplains, making sure that um, the gravels are, are clean and clear, um, that there's lots of woody material and there's flow diversity in the rivers throughout the year is um, yeah, a good way to go, I think. Mm. That might lead on to one other question here. So um, you mentioned the woody debris. The question about whether increasing numbers of otters and beavers might have effects on permissal, either positive or negative effects. So um, on many of the um, SAC rivers designated for freshwater permissals, you will find in, in this country you'll find otters anyway. Um, and I would suggest that beavers are only a good thing because they're restoring some of the functioning um, parts of the, the watercourse. Um, obviously, beavers are herbivorous, so they wouldn't be impacting them by eating them. Otters do eat them, but I would see that as a positive thing because if they're eating them, then there's lots of them about. <laughs> Fair enough. Um, um, possibly uh, it's time for one more. Um, could you expand on the role of freshwater pearl mussel as a keystone species? Um, yeah, I can. Um, so the habitat requirements that are needed to have a, a, a thriving population of freshwater pearl mussels um, are also very similar to things for salmonids, um, for otter, and um, for many um, uh, freshwater species. So if we're targeting the things that freshwater pearl mussels need, because they're such a long lived species, we're talking about over 100 years. Um, in this country, it's usually about 70, so more than my lifespan. And um, we'll be improving things for lot, many generations of um, fish and otters and invertebrates. And one freshwater pearl mussel can filter 50 litres of water a day. Um, so that can only be a good thing in my, in my mind if you've got 400 mussels in one meter riverbeds and they're all filtering 50 liters of water a day, your water quality is going to be awesome. That's, that's really great. Uh, thank, I think we'll call it a day on the questions, but if you have asked a question that we haven't covered, um, we'll, we'll try and come back to you by email with, with responses to those. But um, yeah, thanks for those questions. Uh, just as a reminder, um, we're going to send out our brief feedback questionnaire after this. So if you could um, spend a few minutes to give us some feedback or comments, that would be appreciated. Um, and there's just time for me to give a quick plug for the, our next month's First Thursday Club. Uh, that will be held on Thursday, the 2nd of May. Um, and in that session, Natalie Bryce, the Senior Legal Advisor for RSK Wilding, 
we'll be discussing conservation covenants and responsible bodies in relation to biodiversity net gain um, and what those will mean for landowners. So that's a, a really current and interesting topic and hopefully we'll, we'll see you there. Um, if you missed any of today's presentation or if you'd like to listen again to any of our first Thursday Club talks, uh, you can find links to recordings um, through our website at rskgroup.com and by looking for First Thursday Club under the events. Um, thanks very much for, for tuning in. Thanks, Elizabeth, um, and goodbye. Thank you.